welcome to our service tonight. Let's sing our theme chorus, Laying Up Treasures in Heaven. that you came back on Monday night. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we pray that you will bless in the meeting tonight. Thank you for what's been accomplished already in this missions conference. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to reach our goal, Father. And we pray that you'll bless in the meeting tonight. Uh, speak to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
post flags. Take your hymnal 498, 498, go ye into all the world. Let's sing together this great missions song, 498 in your hymnal. Far, far away in death and darkness dwelling, millions of souls forever may be lost. Who, who will go, salvation story telling, looking to Jesus' mind. about you while the instruments play.
right, before we have our missionaries come give testimony, let's sing that chorus one more time. All power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. Missionary is going to come and give us a word tonight. I'm going to have Brother Elliot come and give us a word challenge tonight. We're glad to have the Elliots here with us, missionaries to South Korea. And uh, our goal is to be able to take them on for support. I hope that you're praying about that. I know that you have been praying and, and uh, making commitments and asking God to help us to reach our goal so that we can take these folks on. Come on, brother. Give us a word of testimony. Let's give them a warm welcome tonight. Amen. We're glad to have them. As I have said earlier this week, I'll say it again, it is a blessing to be here and to get to know you, and I've enjoyed the fellowship that we have enjoyed together already. In the book of Jude, in Jude chapter 1, for those of you that know your Bible, you know there's only one chapter in the book of Jude, but in Jude chapter 1, in verse 22, we read these words, and of some have compassion, making a difference. The context of this passage of scripture has to do with the idea of soul winning. It has the, to do with the idea of reaching people with the gospel. If we were to read the verse of, um, right before that, or right after that, it says, And others save with fire, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. It has to do with the idea of us sharing the gospel with those around us. This, after, this evening, I would like to take you on a trip to South Korea. I'd like to take you on a trip, and we're not going to deal a great deal with the country itself. Some, some presentations and some missionaries show you a travel log of the country. We're, we're not going to do that. We will talk a little bit about the country, but, but not a great deal. Instead, I want to take you on a trip to South Korea, and I want to share with you some of the many ways that God has allowed us to make a difference in the lives of the people in our area. The people in the area where we live, it, it is an international community, and the far majority of them speak English fluently, to the point that our kids are outside on the playground and the Korean kids are talking to our kids in English, and in many cases, better English than our kids are using. Um, but it is an international area, and as such, the ministry that God has given us in that area is an international ministry. Before we show the video, I just want to share two testimonies with you from, from two young men. Burn, um, well, let me start with Levi. Levi came to us from the Philippines. He is on a work visa in, in the country of South Korea, and a work visa is basically legalized slavery. And there, there's really not much other way to describe it. The company he's working for literally runs his life. But it's still a better living condition than what he had in the Philippines. And he's able to send a fair amount of money back to the Philippines to his family, which is why he stays there. He came to us as a believer, but he had not been discipled. He had not been taught the word of God. He had just been saved and said, okay, now you're saved. Good, you're on your way to heaven. And was left. He started coming. We met him. He started coming to church. We started discipling him. I will never forget the day that he came into the discipleship class on Sunday afternoon with me, beaming smile across his face. And he says, Pastor Elliot, Pastor Elliot, I got to talk to you. I just took the stuff that you've been teaching me, and I led my Filipino friend to Christ. Amen. That's what it's about. Another young man came to us from Thailand. He got saved in Thailand had been, and had been going to a Pentecostal community church. And, and he will tell you that church stood for nothing. Um, but he did get saved in that church, and he moved to, to South Korea to take a job working for the UN. 
He is the executive secre secretary for the head of the Green Climate Fund Division of the UN. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Um, the Green Climate Fund is the part of the UN that handles all of the climate change initiatives for the third world. So he, he's in charge of, he, he's the secretary for the director. Um, anyway, he had, been, he had been saved in Thailand and he came to, he came and he says, I know I need a church. And he, he told us he's been praying since he took the job that God would lead him to a good church in Korea. We, we met him out on the street, invited him to church, and he came, and, and he came back, and he came back, and we began, we talked with him, and we met with him. Later, he told me, Brother, Pastor Elliot, I had no clue what Baptist was or what it meant. I thought all Christians were the same. Nobody had ever taught him what the Bible has to say. We began discipling him. We began working with him. We got to the point we started a Bible study at his place of employment at the Green Climate Fund. Um, hey, if you have the opportunity, take the Bible to, yeah. Um, so, so that office building is called G Tower. It's, gov it, it's government tower, and it's primarily occup occupied by UN agencies. We had the opportunity to go in and start a Bible study there. We began meeting with him. Other people began coming. We began discipling him. Ultimately, before we came back on furlough, we turned that Bible study over to um, Brother Byrne. We came back on furlough in March, and, and since we've been back, we've been getting emails from Brother Byrne, and they'd usually start something like this. Brother Byrne, I'm, I'm sorry, Pastor Elliot, I've been reading in my Bible, and I have a question. And some of his questions have just been, they've been doozies. But he has an, an open, honest heart that's willing to learn and very teachable. But in April, I got an email that started a little bit different. It said, Pastor Elliot, I've been praying, I've been reading, I've been studying my Bible, and I really believe that God would have me to go back to Thailand to reach my people Amen. with the gospel. Amen. My contract is up in about two years. Will you help prepare me to go back to Thailand to tell my people with the gospel? That's what your prayers and your missions dollars do all around the world. I want to take you on a trip to Korea, and I want to show you how God has allowed us to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. The Republic of Korea, where modern life and tradition intersect. South Korea is a land of 51 million people, approximately the size of the state of Indiana. About 60% of the land is mountainous. This has caused the people to congregate in several large cities, with Seoul being the largest. The Seoul metro area has over 21 million people. After the Korean War, Korea was decimated. However, today, Korea is a first world nation. Partially as a result of this rapid progress, there are many social problems. The family structure has broken down with parents living separate lives. Religion once a backbone of Korean society, has been replaced with the search for wealth and better education. Statistically, 50% of the Korean population claim no religious background. Of the remainder, 30% claim to be Buddhist, and 20% claim to be Christian, with the majority of those practicing a corrupted version of Christianity based on works. It is to these people that God has called us to take the good news of salvation. We are the Elliott family, missionaries to the people of Korea. By God's grace, we have been able to make a difference in Asia for the past 12 years, with the past six years being in Korea. As we consider the last few years, we would like to share some of the ways that God has allowed us to make a difference in Korea. 
When we first arrived in Korea, we began working with Pastor Toto Pakalbar, a Filipino missionary to Korea. Brother Toto started Wonju Bethel Baptist Church in Wonju, South Korea. There, we were able to assist in a variety of different ministries as we started to learn the Korean language and began the adaptation process of living in Korea. We are very thankful for Wonju Bethel Baptist Church and the people there. We continue to assist them in various outreach ministries throughout the year, especially with family camp and special children's outreach efforts. In early 2013, the Nathan Kowak family moved to Chunshan, where we were living. We began working together to start Chunshan Lighthouse Baptist Church. For the next two and a half years, we ministered together there in Chunshan, working in all aspects of the ministry, from teaching and preaching to passing out tracts, holding game nights, and other special activities as we spread the gospel there. We were with Chunshan Lighthouse Baptist Church until they were able to get their first building. Also during this time, we had the opportunity to assist Pastor Yang at Faith Baptist Church of Kangnan. There, we were able to assist in various aspects of the ministry, helping with things such as children's camp, special children's outreach activities, and other special activities, as well as filling the pulpit. In late 2015, God opened the door for us to move to Incheon, South Korea. Incheon is a city of 2.9 million people and is part of the Seoul metro area, a metro area of 21 million people. Although it seems as if there are churches on every corner, there are still literally millions of people that have never heard that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. As with all major cities, it is an international gathering point. Within a three mile radius of our apartment, I have been able to identify over 80 different nationalities, with the majority of these people coming from other Asian nations, some of which that it is hard, if not impossible, to spread the gospel. God truly has brought the world to our doorstep. Because of its international roots, the majority of the people in our area speak English fluently, and English is a major outreach opportunity. Since moving to Incheon, we have been working with Incheon International Baptist Church. God has blessed, and in October of 2017, we were able to transition this church to Korean leadership. At this time, it is totally indigenous, with no missionary involvement or support. Jude 22 says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. Our outreach to those around us shows our love for Christ and our love for our fellow man. It makes a difference. As a stone thrown into a pond continues to ripple, so does each life that is touched with the gospel of Christ. It makes a difference. Will you continue to be involved in making a difference in the lives of the people of Korea through prayer and support of our family? Brother George Zaris is going to come with uh, Christian Radio International. Come and give us a word, brother. We're so glad to have him. Let's give him a warm welcome tonight as well. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. Boy, that was terrific. I'm ready to go to Korea. You know, when I was a student at Tennessee Temple, that's where I st first started going to missionary conferences. It was required as a student. Dr. Robertson had it. And uh, boy, I, I just sat there every time, every year. You know, I was there five years, getting six years worth of education. And uh, a missionary would stand up and, and you know, I, I'd look at Barbara and I said, well, I'll go there. And uh, she said, so would I. You know, and then the next one would come and we'd go, boy, I'd go there. I'd go there. And guess what? The Lord sent us to all of them now. <laughs> We're going to them. Amen. Praise the Lord for that and uh, great presentation I'm excited we're going to partner with you in the project because we have our Korean pastor from Washington State going to our studios in Dawsonville Georgia in January he will preach we will begin raising funds to drop the gospel over Korea and over North Korea praise the Lord Amen. and I am praying for the day and I hope you're solidly in there and I know you, you'd be involved in it when North Korea will open up to the gospel of Jesus Christ Amen. what an exciting day well <clears throat> let me read something to you here <clears throat> then also hath God developed Gilead das er seinen 
ein geborenen Sohn gab, auf das alle, die an ihn glauben, nicht verloren würden, so dern es das ewige Leben haben. How was that? How many of you that was Greek to you? How many of you knew what I said? Good. Praise the Lord. That was in German. But I wanted to I wanted to do that to show you something. People have to hear the gospel in a language they understand. Otherwise, we're not doing them any good. And so we just sang, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every man, woman, boy, and girl on planet Earth. And I'm excited. I am totally excited that God has taken us into over 130 countries preaching the gospel to these people, three and a half billion of them, in a language they understand. And then we're moving into China and going to pick up 850 million Chinese, potentially, that can understand the Chinese message. I don't understand it, but they do. And praise the Lord for it. Very quickly, I just want to uh, give you a report. Because, again, I've been your missionary for many years. And we recently, in the last few months, began broadcasting the gospel into Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan. And already we have reported 12 Iranian men saved as a result of those broadcasts. But not only saved, every one of them, all 12 of them, are in studies twice a week getting discipled, in other words, grounded in their faith. And that's, that's what excites me. Yeah. This is one of those that what, what I call most favored nations. Now you say, Brother Zaris, Iran is a terrorist nation. Yes, I understand that. That's the government. That's the leadership, the Muslim leadership in the, in the religion and in the government. But God has put his hand upon the country of Iran. And God is blessing that country. 500 believers at best when the country was overthrown and the Ayatollah Khomeini came in to take leadership. Today, as many as 7 million born-again Christians inside the country of Iran. That's not even counting all of them that have gotten saved that are outside of the country. And that's in a country of 90 million people people. Jesus is real in Iran. Okay? I'm not a Pentecostal preacher. I'm an independent, fundamental, King James, all the adjectives, but God is doing a special work among these people. Amen. Farouz contacted us in the last couple months. Farouz got saved. Beruz is the first one, preacher, that has said, I want to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that's okay. You say, why? Because Michael Garmy, our preacher, the day he got saved, he got called to preach. And on his knees in, in, in his bedroom of his house in Sydney, Australia, he prayed and said, Lord, use me any way you can. Just use me. So here's... Here's a young man already called to preach. He wants to be a pastor. He wants Michael to train him. Siamak. He said, since my salvation, I haven't smoked at all. I used to smoke two packs a day. Siamak grew up with Michael Garmy. He's from northern Iraq. And they grew up, and they were friends when they were young men. And now they're brothers in Christ. Siamak is growing tremendously. And 
Siamak has already witnessed to another man who has contacted Michael. Hadn't even heard him. Hadn't, hadn't seen him on TV. But through Siamak, he's found out about Michael and they are meeting together and Michael is introducing him to Jesus Christ. Here's another one. Homan, H-O-O-M-A-N. I'm not giving you last names because we've got to protect their identity. He was arrested and thrown in prison for purchasing a copy of the Bible. His uncle got him released by somehow paying off the right person. So he's free right now. And he said to Michael, can you help me find a church in Iran? That's kind of hard to do. It would be a house church, and even, and there are many of them, but the house churches have to be careful of anybody that they invite in because it could be a Muslim spy. And if that happens, then they, they take everybody and throw them in jail, persecute them uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Michael cannot get it. We, we don't know of a church to put him in, but Michael is discipling him twice a week. They spend a few hours on the Internet, and he's teaching him the Word of God, and he's growing in his faith in Jesus Christ. How about this guy, Mohammed? That's a good Muslim name, isn't it? <coughs> Muslim asked, uh, Muhammad asked, what do I have to do to be a Christian? Is there any prayer that I need to pray? Now let me, as I used to say to my people in Tennessee when I pastored in the mountains of Tennessee, let me explain that to you. Okay? In Islam, You've got to say the exact right prayer. You cannot even mispronounce one word. And these, these uh, Persian Muslims have been taught that they can only pray in Arabic. So most of the time when they pray in Arabic, they don't even know what the words mean. They just memorize the words and remote, you know, rotely say them over and over and over again every time they hit the, hit the rug you know five times a day praying to Allah and they got to pray in the right direction and they got to pronounce it correctly so you understand why Muhammad asked you know is there any prayer that I need to pray but then he said but I need to throw away the Quran but that's not Quran's folks that's the holy book of Islam he said, I need to throw away the Koran and all the Islamic prayers from my home first. That's what he said. Now, you don't have to do that, but it's okay that he did it. So Michael said, I told him to call on the name of the Lord Jesus, confessing his sins and believing that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for his sins and ask him to be his Savior. He didn't get saved that day. But the next day, he contacted Michael via the Internet, and he said, it was such a heavy prayer when I prayed. Now, I love the way these guys talk. And asked Jesus to save me. I felt so good. I felt that a burden was lifted up from me, and a peace of God came to me. Hassan from Tehran, and Tehran is the capital of Iran, he said, quote, I really like your teachings and doctrines. Can you teach me to be a Baptist? Now, we know being a Baptist is not the most important thing, but we understood what he was talking about, that Michael found all his teachings from the Word of God. And he wanted to, to learn. He said, uh, so can you teach me so that I can teach uh, the Baptist doctrines to others in Iran? Michael said yes, obviously. And he has been discipling Hassan for weeks. 
You say, well, why only for weeks? He just started a few months ago, folks. I mean, this, this, these are five quick testimonies of 12 men that have already come to Christ, and that's in Iran. That's not counting the people here in the United States that have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. As Michael and I were traveling together, I had the opportunity to go with him as he was witnessing to these Muslim men. And uh, praise the Lord, uh, we, we have a merchant here in, in the Sarasota area who received Christ as his Savior. He's afraid to go to church. He's afraid to go to a church because if he goes to a church that openly identifies him no longer as a Muslim. And he's afraid of the repercussions. Pray for him. Up in north, northwest Indiana, real close to where Barb and I live, we went and talked to a man uh, who was a Muslim. And uh, a Christian brother in an independent Baptist church lived right next to him and had been witnessing to him but really didn't know how to deal you know, with somebody who is Islamic. And uh, so we went to that man's house, and for three hours, Michael dealt with this man, and in three hours, that man received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and began attending the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church in his area. God wants people saved. He wants people all over the world saved. But they can't get saved unless there's a preacher. We are getting the gospel to the world. Thank you for partnering with Christian Radio International. Let's reach the world. Amen. Let's take our hymnals 490. Sound the battle cry. It is a battle cry. And uh, Satan is our enemy. We want to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stand together as we sing 490 before the offering this evening. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm, everyone, rest your calls upon his holy word. Arouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward. Shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of a mighty throng. Strong to meet the foe, not G, not we go. Well, our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light. Battling for the right we ne'er can fail. Arouse and soldiers, rally round the battle. offering in just a moment. We'll receive the children's offering as well, so you can hold those dollars up and the children will come and, and receive those. Going to have uh, good uh, have Aaron Asworthy. I know he's been working uh, many, many hours because of uh, I, I get those letters every day in the mail, brother, wanting me to change my health insurance, and so it's a time for him. Why don't you lead us in a word of prayer? Would you do that, brother? Amen. You may be seated.
I need you to hold up 20s. We're going to have the teenagers come around. So. Uh, we're glad to have our pastor's wife, Martha, come in to sing tonight. Martha? Let's go. 
let the children be dismissed for their missionary story tonight. Praise the Lord for all the children. Amen. I think that's a big deal to have the children. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Good group of kids. The Lord tarries is coming. Those are going to be the missionaries. Amen. We're so glad to have the evangelist, Dr. Bud Calvert, here with us. He was pastor for many years at the Fairfax Baptist Temple and did a, just a tremendous job. Just one of the great churches in America. And uh, now he preaches all around the world. And we're so glad to have he and his dear wife here. Let's give him a warm welcome as he comes to preach the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> uh, the truth of the matter is I'm just Bud Calvert, plain old Bud Calvert, nothing special. Uh, but I am delighted to be here, and I'm glad my wife can join me as well. Uh, we always enjoy being in mission conferences where we can talk about the Lord and have the most important week of the year for a church. When we think about the Lord's business and what God wants to do through you as individuals and as a church family. And thankfully, God's program is that we all come together as a church body and pitch in together, do our best part before God, and then together see what we can do for missions and world evangelism and getting more people saved and getting more churches started while there's yet time, because certainly the Lord is coming back soon. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 24. The book of Luke, <clears throat> chapter 24. Mary and I have enjoyed being here. We always enjoy being with your pastor and his wife. They're very special people, as you already know. Uh, but we praise the Lord for them and for the wonderful time of fellowship we've been able to have together with them as well. And uh, thank the Lord for staying at uh, Miss Jill's house. She's been so hospitable uh, to us as well. This steak and lobster every night has just been superb. <laughs> uh, but we... We've had a blast over there with, with her, and thank the Lord for kind hospitality. And just for each one of you, uh, I know having a part in the missionary lives and uh, being able to assist with meals and lodging and, and all of it, uh, it that's, goes a long way when you can help other people uh, like that as well. And I'm not speaking myself, but I mean but doing for others like that. Is, it's a great blessing to be able to <clears throat> just kind of reach out and be involved in it. Was it where were we last night or somewhere here recently talking about how many of you uh, have? Well, in fact, I know with the, the, the pastor and his wife both as well, but how many people talked about having missionaries in their home when they were kids, you know, and now all of a sudden we're adults, but it impacted our lives when we were children. And I think just doing that is some of you all are doing with your family, it uh, goes a long way in being able to make a impact upon your children's lives as well as your own. But in Luke chapter 24, uh, due to the shortness of time, I'm going to read the whole passage <clears throat> because God's Word is more important than mine. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I've always thought, you know, I hear people say, you know, run out of time. I'm just going, hey, listen, if you're running short on time, give more of God's Word, not your Word. But anyhow, uh, <clears throat> that's just my little weird thinking. But <clears throat> in, in chapter 24 of Luke, and verse 36. In verse 36, the Bible says, <clears throat> And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit, a ghost, if you would. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold, my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see. For spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, 
These were, are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your holy word. And we are grateful for the joy and privilege it's ours to hold a copy of it in our hands and to be able to have Christ in our lives as well and the Holy Ghost being able to lead and direct us. And Lord, I pray we'll always have an openness to thee to sit on the throne of our lives that we'll give you our all that you might direct us bless us together now lord i pray in jesus name amen i was looking just today <clears throat> again and i've seen a couple of different things on but statistically that there are about 2500 missionary families from independent baptist churches that are out on the field trying to get more churches started, seeing more people come to Christ, trying to spread the good news around the world. And when you think about, and that's not counting in America, but when you think about the seven and a half billion people on this earth, we have a long way to go. There's a lot to be done. There's much that we need to be thinking about and we need to be praying about and we need to be giving toward and we need to be going forward on ourselves. I find out that in ministering, that when it comes to missions, missions is one of those things that we do in church that oftentimes I can sit there in my chair just like this and say, when is this thing going to be over? Without ever getting committed. But I think that's the absolute wrong idea about missions and world evangelism. Say, so, well, God hasn't called me to go. Well, have you considered it? Well, I just not, it's just not for me. And it may not be. I'll be honest with you. The first time my wife and I took a trip, we went to uh, Japan and Korea and Hong Kong and the Philippines. Um, and we did have a layover in Hawaii. I confess that. <clears throat> uh, and then we came back <clears throat> uh, as well. But I mean, I have to admit, when I first went over there, I thought, my goodness, I've been pastoring for eight years at that time. And I thought, what am I going to do if I get over there and get called? It scared me to death. And I'm just being honest with you. It scared me. I thought, I, I mean, I don't speak their language. I don't eat their kimchi. And no, I'm not used to that stuff. And I thought, well, I've got to give it a try somehow and cross my face. I'm not, I mean, pray that, <clears throat> that I'll be able to stay where I was, you know, and, and not have to be thinking about that or not be as concerned about that but I really did it challenged me to say well bud is your heart open if that is what God wants you to do and I'm just saying for me as a pastor at that time of eight years that went through my heart and mind so I know what it is to be able to get to the place where you say here's my all Lord I want to lay it on the altar and I'll do whatever you want me to do but I think about the need. I, I think of there's some 200 countries in our world, and we fundamental independent Baptists have missionaries in about 130 of those countries, and there's at least 80 some countries where we have no independent Baptist missionary evangelists that are interested or being able to get out there and, and uh, <clears throat> try to plant churches as well. And as we heard the other last night, I guess it was, it seems like we've been here for a couple of weeks, but it was just yesterday. Uh, but it, as I just heard uh, that 
you know, there's no such thing as a closed country. It's absolutely right. I've often wondered in my mind, if they're closed, who closed them? It sure wasn't God, because he died for the world. Uh, you know, and so I think they're, they're open to us. They're just a little more difficult to get into sometimes. But sometimes the best things are a little bit harder to work on. But you still work on it. You don't give up. You don't throw in the towel just because it's a little bit of effort that we have to uh, put into it to be able to make it work. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, yet we think about the work of the Lord. But notice, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he returned to his disciples uh, only to find out, as it said in, in verse 37, when he stood in the midst of them, verse 36 and 7, he stood in the midst of them and said, hey, peace be unto you. I mean, he was, I think, probably excited. Hey, I'm back. Three days. They, they couldn't hold me in the grave. I'm alive and I'm, and I'm back here and, and, and peace be unto you. And what did he get? The Bible says those people in verse 37, they were terrified and affrighted. That means they were scared to death. I mean, they thought, oh my goodness, we're seeing a spirit. There's a ghost here. I mean, that can't be Jesus Christ. We just saw him crucified and died and all of his blood came out and they put him in a grave and they rolled that stone and we saw we know he acts that 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 i mean hey you sometimes you read the bible glibly and you think but let me ask you what would you do if you saw a dead person three days later i mean that'd make you stop and think a little bit i mean it's like hey they've never seen that before uh, and so don't, don't sit there so smugly when you're reading your Bible and say, oh, what are those guys scared about? You'd have been scared out of your whatever you had on. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, it would be tough. To, so these guys were scared to death. And so Jesus is there trying to calm them. They thought for sure something, something weird was happening to them, and they didn't know what it was. So he then <clears throat> tried to assure them and said, look, if if you, you want look at look at my hands and look at my feet, there, I've got holes in them. That, that's me. It's Jesus. And that wasn't working. Give, give me a piece of that fish. I'm going to show you something. Watch me. I'm going to eat this thing. And so he took that fish and ate the fish a little bit. You know, so see, now, you know, only flesh and blood's going to eat that. And, and so, I mean, he took it. didn't have his blood, but he took it. And so I'm saying these people were scared, and rightly so, seeing that as well, because they... They thought they had an honest trust and evaluation of the Lord, but they were disciples. They were human like we are. And, and he talked about, you know, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And they kind of liked the analogy a little bit, but they didn't know if really how that was going to work out. And that they know of his talking about it, and they were sure hoping that it was going to work out that way. But I think they were rather nervous about it <laughs> as well. But he wanted them, if you notice what he said in verse 46, when he said that he said unto them, Thus it is written, thus it behoove Christ to suffer and <clears throat> to rise from the dead the third day. You know something? Sometimes when it comes to witnessing and giving out the gospel, we say, well, you know, it's so complicated thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's so complimented when complicated for me to go up and start talking to someone about the Lord. But the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection. That's all. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to say that. Uh, and that our Savior is alive. And to be able to share that with other people because that's our responsibility. It's not something we give out or delegate to a missionary or a pastor or evangelist somewhere. It's something every born-again believer has the responsibility to declare his glory among the heathen. That's my job and your job as born-again believers. But I want us to think a little bit uh, about what God wants us to do. And I, to pick up the right attitude is God commissioned our local churches to get involved and to do what we can to reach more people for the Lord. Because he said there, if you notice again, that verse 47, he said in that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations <clears throat> uh, beginning at Jerusalem. And I remind us, people don't get saved without repenting. Repentance tells me I've got a need for somebody to forgive me. And I need that faith in Jesus Christ alone to get all of my sins forgiven that I've committed. 
So we have that faith and we have that repentance and that absolute trust in the Lord that he wants. But he said, look, he wants his name spoken and preached about in all nations, preaching not from a pulpit, but either from giving a tract, saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his good works and what he has done for all of us. And let me tell you how wonderful he's been to me and how thrilling it is. But he said, I just want you to give out that gospel, the good news. And by the way, folks, all the religions that are out there, we've heard a little bit about Islam tonight as well and Buddhism, all the religions out there, there's only one that has a resurrected Savior. And he's ours. <laughs> and we have a corner on truth with, uh, with that and a corner on heaven. Uh, I got a good backup plan last night when I got that ticket that you all gave out at the banquet on ticket to go to heaven just in case nothing else works out. I know that ticket's going to get me there because because you're, you're honest people here, I'm sure. But, but you think, you know, Lord, I think God did it all for us so we could have eternal life. And he wants us to tell him, and notice what he said, he, he wants that, that uh, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. That's not just the 200 and some countries that are out there. That's the 7,000 and some ethnic groups that are out there. And the word nations there... And the Greek name for it, the Greek word is the word ethnos, where we get our word ethnic. Uh, and so he's saying, not just a big country, but he said, I want you to go to a place like Africa and go into every one of the, every one of the little ethnic tribes that are out there. I want you to tell everyone about Jesus Christ and all of them over in the Orient and all of them in the jungles and all the people in Latin America, every, every ethnic group there is. <laughs> We need to be doing I, I told our people many times and when I was pastoring in Fairfax, Virginia, that we have a responsibility of reaching all those people over in Africa and all the, the ethnic groups down in Latin America and over in the Orient. And we've got to reach out to the country of West Virginia and Tennessee and try I mean, those people are different, you know. I mean, trust me. But anyhow, uh, we gotta reach everybody with the gospel. I mean, and that's our responsibility that God has given to us. So I, I think we've got to just get in our hearts and our minds that now I'm going to go very quickly as well. I want you to think for just a moment about God's global plan, what God has in mind for all of us, God's global plan, because sometimes churches get so bogged down with trying to kind of make ends meet and trying to make things go just right and keep the machinery well oiled. And I think a lot of times our churches have gotten real good at doing church and we forget about a world that's lost and dying and hell bound without the gospel and truth about Jesus Christ. And so we've got to be thinking about it all the time. It, it has to be part of our DNA that we're thinking, Lord, help us and do what we can in glorifying our Lord and evangelizing the world because that is our purpose of what we're supposed to be doing as well. So God's program of world evangelism <clears throat> Uh, it can be done in God's ordained way that he has in the Bible. The one thing he says in the Bible uh, is that aspect of getting out and starting more churches and getting more churches planted and doing what we can. <clears throat> there are a lot of ways we do that, uh, but the ultimate goal is always, according to the Holy Bible, it's always church planting. It's always to get people saved and called and trained in and through the local church. He didn't set up little hubs out there and little Bible studies to do their thing. That's not God's program. They're all nice sideline things, but the real menu, the real meal that we have is the local New Testament church that God has set up to give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to teach and train people in the training process that goes on in and through the church that we're to be involved in and helping with and doing and working. God has equipped every one of us as a believer. Each of us has at least one gift from God. And I'm to be using that gift, according to the Bible, in and through my local church. That's what the Bible teaches. In Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Romans chapter 12. They're, they're gifts that are given out to be used in and through the church to be able to reach more people for the Lord. So I've got to be working on that. I've got to be thinking about how can we help out? Well, part of God's gracious uh, work that he has, uh, his global plan in reaching this world for Christ, 
uh, is a big one. Uh, look back with, in Matthew chapter 9, very familiar. These scriptures have already been quoted or alluded to uh, or thought about. Uh, but uh, just to remind us again of something that's vitally important in the book of Matthew. <clears throat> in the book of Matthew chapter 9, here is a key thing. This is, this is what God set up <clears throat> as his program to help be able to get his work done <clears throat> uh, that needs to get done. The Bible tells us <clears throat> in the book of Matthew and chapter 9 and verse 36. In verse 36, the Bible says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, I simply want to remind us of something. Sometimes we get in our minds <clears throat> that God is wanting to do his work, but he hadn't quite figured out how to get it done. He told us to go into all the world <clears throat> and preach the gospel to everybody. I mean, every person needs to hear the word of God. And here's the plan of salvation. Here are the good news and the gospel. And that's our job. That's the work that we have. We think it's not going to be done. God's set up his program, local church. Local church can use any avenue at once. It can use radio, TV. It can use gospel track, the printed page. It can use extra Bibles. Being, it can use anything. It can use jails and work people and get saved in jail. Any way we can. The thing is, is God's program that he set up is having laborers called. We think, well, it's not going to work. But when God says, pray ye therefore, Lord. So it's not like Lord's worried stiff, hadn't figured his thing out yet. He's got the answer. The problem is the laborers are few. That's the difficulty. When we think about unemployment in America, and we keep watching the numbers down, wow, they're below 5% now. It's fantastic. It's amazing to get it down that low, down to 4% level. I mean, you ought to think about the unemployment in the average independent Baptist church today of people who aren't serving God through their church that get satisfied with doing nothing. And I'm not, I'm, that's not the crowd I'm preached to because this is Monday night and you're here. Thank the Lord for it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> just like you're here, all you all were here last, last night, Sunday night. <laughs> I've, I've seen so many churches. I've been in a lot of different churches now. So many people after seeing them on Sunday morning, Sunday night I don't see them. They're still watching Ed Sullivan on Sunday nights. I know they are, because I remember him being on about 7 o'clock at night. And so a lot of people do that instead of getting involved in serving God. They, it's just, I don't want to be committed to something like that. Well, you get committed to your job, committed to work, committed to going to school. <clears throat> I mean, you, there are so many things. You, but I'm saying God has his program. We can't take away from it. And we've got to be involved in. So the problem is, it's not that God's wringing his hands. God has just simply said, look, let me tell you what the big need is. And as he says, look, he said, I, I see the multitudes, and I'm burdened for them, and I care about them, and, and I died for them. I shed my blood for them. But the problem, he says, is, is even after seeing it, they looked like a bunch of sheep that were fainting, and they just scattered everywhere, and, Nobody leading them, nobody feeding them, nobody providing for them. He said, the problem is that the harvest is, is plenty. Of, there's, there's plenty of people out there to get saved, but there's no laborers to go get them. And that's true in the local church area, our Jerusalem, that it's our responsibility as a church here to go out into every area, in the highways and hedges, and ask them politely to come more. No compel them to come in that my house may be filled I want to do everything I can to reach just one more person with the gospel of Jesus Christ yeah. and God needs laborers to do it and so all of us need to be asking ourselves Lord I've got the responsibility of world evangelism of reaching every ethnic group and I remind us when we go door to door and everyone can be involved in door to door somewhere to not me preacher I'd be scared stiff welcome to the club we all are scared stiff when we go out knocking on doors. I mean, Paul was scared stiff. He said, listen here, I want you to tell you, put on all the armor of God and 
put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and take that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Verse 18. He kind of, just a little bit of Bud Calvert parallelism. He said, and by the way, so if you don't mind, would you pray for me that I might have boldness? I mean, because so many times I just get scared stiff out there. He didn't say that, but, but I know that's what he was thinking because I've done the same thing. He said, so I just get scared. So pray for me that I, I might have boldness to open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think Paul said that. So look, if Paul said it, join the club. You're in a good club. Uh, he too got scared about knocking on doors or talking to people about Jesus Christ or handing out gospel tracts. He too talked about it, and he was concerned about it. But it's a responsibility each of us has. And you ought to make sure when you leave those doors tonight, you stop out there in the foyer, you make sure you've got a handful of tracts, stick them in your pocket, stick them in your purses, stick them in your cars, uh, and by the way, it's so nice if you've bought a car in the last 50 years, almost every car out there now provides a tray for gospel tracts. And I thought it's the neatest thing. And they, just, they have a little tray you come out and you, for gospel tracts, I'm sure, because we don't smoke, so it's got to be uh, for the tracts. So just put them in it. So you always have them in your car. They're always with you so that you have them there. And I, I'll take a bunch. I usually get about that, a stack that much, many. Uh, every few weeks, I'll get a stack like that, and I stick it in the little side part of my car, uh, right there in the little thing on the door, and put them all there so I have them. I always carry them. <clears throat> Lord, please let there be a track here. Yeah. I always carry tracks here in my pocket, too. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. I had that quick prayer. Just <clears throat> but, uh, but. You put them in your wallet, wherever you, whatever you have. Just, I mean, so you always have them with you and give out your tracks so you have them to talk to people about the Lord. And, folks, it's, it's just so vitally important. I, I couldn't help but think one time we were, we had a bus worker, uh, and he was an older man. Uh, good night. He was probably my age now. But anyhow, uh, he was an old guy back in my days earlier, and, and uh, this was 25 years or so ago. And... And uh, he was a, a, one of our bus captains. Anyhow, he knocked on the door. Nobody was home. He just left the track, went on the next door, and was working his bus around Saturday. Well, Sunday, <clears throat> this man, uh, a Korean man and his family came to our church. And he thought, you know, Fairfax Baptist Temple. And he said, I, I knew what a temple was because I'm from Korea. He came to over to Washington, D.C. area to study politics. Uh, and then they wanted to go back and be a politician back in South Korea. <clears throat> and so I said, I thought, I want to see, see what they believe there about the Bible, but I'm not sure. So he, he brought his wife and his mother. His mother didn't speak a word of English. Brought them to the church service, <clears throat> and he spoke a good bit of English. Uh, <clears throat> still have a hard time sometimes understanding him. But, but, he, but so he said, uh, when I got there, he said, oh, he said, uh, you had a Bible verse up there back in the, you know, in the 70s or 80s there, and we used to put Bible verses up there, and that's styrofoam, you know. And I said, you had a Bible verse up there, Jeremiah 33, 3. So he said, well, at least I know they believe the Old Testament. And he, he didn't know what we believed. Uh, and he hadn't been here in the States very long. He said, and then when you preach, he said, you preached out of the New Testament. And so he said, well, great, they believe the Bible here. And so it went on, and he had had a Presbyterian background. He wasn't sure about anything, really. Just whatever God predestinated, he was happy with. And, but he came and he sat there through a few services and, and eventually got born again and got saved and, and came in. And shortly after that, his, uh, he then got called into the ministry. He's going to forget the politician part. And now, so then he got called in the ministry, went off to Bible college, came back, and we commissioned him. And he went to Anaheim, California, where he is today. Uh, 20 some years later he started the Calvary Baptist Church there as a matter of fact in Anaheim it's all Korean church uh, and it's fantastic they have 75 to 100 people or so every Sunday uh, in their services they've had fellows called into ministry that have been training out at West Coast and studying for the ministry to be able to start another Korean church somewhere uh, and it's so exciting to be able to see what he's doing he said you know he said I wasn't sure about coming he said my mom was a Christian and he said, I just wasn't. He said, my mom was a Christian. So he said, I asked my mom. And he said, my, my 
uh, mama uh, decided to pray, and, and so she went out praying in the morning and at 8 o'clock in the morning and, and kept praying until 9 o'clock. I said, you mean to tell me your mother went out? She went out, and this was in Northern Virginia. You have to, if you've ever been up in that area, you've been on the beltway that goes around Washington, D.C. They had an apartment that lives right there on that beltway <clears throat> uh, off of it, and his mother, didn't speak a word of English, comes out and walks around, not on the parkway, but in that area right in there, and said, I said, you mean your mother went out and walked around for an hour? I said, no, no, I mean, she left 8 in the morning, came back 9 o'clock at night. She'd been praying the whole time <clears throat> about this matter, where to go to church and what was right. And said, Mom said it's good to come. I said, look, if Mom said it's good to come, you come to our church then because I'm, I'm with your mom. Anybody can pray that long. And she was just that kind of a woman <clears throat> that, that prayed. And he came. And uh, God called him in the ministry. And I had a man that was in our church. He was about 50 years of age. And he was a, a retired military officer. <clears throat> and... We had a lot of them around, and then uh, he was in that, back in the Reagan administration, Star Wars program, if you remember that as, as well. He was involved in the Star Wars program and right up there working with them, and God called him in the ministry. And say, well, how do you know if you call it? I, I'll tell you how Charles Spurgeon defines it. He, Charles Spurgeon said, it's an overwhelming desire for the work of the ministry. That's a quote. <clears throat> an overwhelming, it's something about it, it's just, Wow, you know, it's just, you've got to, you know. And those of us that are in the ministry, we can all say amen to that. It's just, you can't do anything else. I mean, it's just, it's something you just want to do. It just, it's, you get that overwhelming desire. I was a student at East Carolina University in Greenville, North Carolina. I went there for one reason. Though. After three years in the military, <clears throat> and I got out, I started attending a church a little bit, but then uh, I wasn't saved, and my former next-door neighbor went to East Carolina. He said, Bud, he said, it's the best party school in the East Coast. So I went to the party school, East Carolina. And so after being there for about a year or so, that's when I met Mary. And then after I met Mary, uh, right after that, I got saved. <laughs> and, uh, and then got in a good church while I was down there. And, and then God called me in ministry. It's just like, wow, I can't be going into the ministry. I mean, me? Uh, I mean, you have to go to college for that. I wasn't, didn't want to know if I wanted to finish it all right. But I think the Lord works and calls us. I had a man who uh, was preaching at a mission conference in our church in Fairfax uh, a few years ago. A man came forward and said, I believe God's called me. He's lieutenant colonel uh, in the Army. And he's getting out of the service here shortly and uh, preparing. To, and he's already taken, gotten his master's degree in Bible through uh, online correspondence. Uh, while he was still in the military and he's getting out soon and he wants to be able to be sent out from our home church back in Fairfax uh, to go to Italy <clears throat> to be able to plant an indigenous Italian church. He, he was uh, <clears throat> studied Italian when he was in the military. He was a liaison officer. Uh, anyhow, God just used that. I'm saying God can call you. God can do that work <clears throat> in your life to see that. I had a teenage boy in our church that... Uh, got called his 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 dad uh, picked up a gospel track that that we had had and he picked it up off of a, in a gas station and got the track came and had two boys and both boys got saved and the one boy was about 16 or 17 years old he had another year in high school he finished and then in that time he got saved and came forward to one of the preaching services Went off to Bible college for four years. After that, came back, served an internship for three years, and then went up to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, uh, Brother Scott Wendell, and started a church up there uh, 30 years ago now <clears throat> and planted a church. And they have had uh, seven men from their church to go out and plant more churches, and some over, one over in Israel. Uh, but just God's done a phenomenal work. And so for all of us, we have to think about, all of you men, all of you boys need to be thinking, Lord, what about me? Would you have me to go? I mean, is that something that I could do? Say, but I've got my career. It doesn't make any difference. Peter had his career in the Bible as a fisherman, but he gave that up to be able to be used of God. And Paul was out working as a religious leader, but he gave that up to be able to be involved in helping to start more churches for the Lord. And for all of us need to think about, young ladies, would you ever marry a preacher? Uh, say, absolutely not. But it's a good thing. You might even find out that it could be something good for you to be able to do and be a part of it because every man needs a God-fearing woman by his side if he's going to go in the ministry. That's just a given. <clears throat>
But I think you've got, for everybody needs to be thinking about whatever it is that you want to, maybe is the Lord can use you as a, as a man or to a woman to do anything in ministry. But some get called to be pastors, some get called to be missionary evangelists who go out and plant more churches or are itinerant evangelists. And I think God wants to use you. And they say, well, I know that's not what God wants. I, that may be true. I'm just simply saying you need to be open to it. They say, well, I don't know. I just, I just, I've never been called. I just never felt the call at all. I say, well, do you know what it feels like to feel called? Well, if you don't know what it feels like to feel called, how do you know you haven't felt the feeling you're supposed to feel in order to feel called? You don't. It's not a feeling. It's something said, Lord, woe is me. I mean, Lord, it's something I believe you might want me to do. And I can consider it. That just may be the possibility God has for me. No matter how strong or how charismatic you might be in your personality, that's not the point. You can have the power of God upon you to do his work. And if God doesn't call you into the ministry as a full-time servant of the Lord, certainly you could probably figure out a way to give up an hour or two or three to go out and knock on doors or follow up and visit somebody that's been here on Sunday and try to reach them for the Lord. Certainly we could figure out a little bit of time. We might go to be able to go to a neighbor and talk to them about the Lord and see if they couldn't get saved or somehow work with them. I'm just saying there's opportunities if we just take the time and express our Christianity from our lives. That's what God wants. I mean, he's really looking for men and women uh, and young people who say, Lord, here am I. Send me. But before Isaiah could say that, that's when he fell prostrate to the, to the ground and said, woe is me. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And I think, Lord, help us. Maybe you want me to. And if I'm not the one to be able to go, then certainly I can really get involved around here. There are a lot of opportunities. You've got snowbirds coming down here by the thousands. <clears throat> uh, and I think instead of throwing nails under those cars that have Michigan license plates on them, <clears throat> uh, you, you could, you know, uh, you could you maybe pray for them. I don't know if, that's, if you could do it or not, but you could try praying for them. Uh, and praying that, that the Lord will work in their heart. And hey, you just, you just never know, is my point, to talk to them about Jesus, to give them a gospel, to invite them to come to church here. I think of all these people there, they get away from home, they get away from the north up there, uh, and uh, they're looking for a friend. And hey, just to befriend them, just plan to take somebody out to lunch on Sunday afternoon after church, somebody that's visiting in here, and just kind of befriend somebody. You just don't know. You could reach someone like that with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or the, maybe God would call them into the ministry and be able to send them out someday and to work on it and, and to just let God know. We had a Christian school in our church <clears throat> and, uh, where we were training our young people. And I remember this one couple that came up to me <clears throat> on a Sunday night <clears throat> after church. I'll never forget <clears throat> Uh, they came up to me, and they walked down the aisle, because I always stood up in front on Sunday nights and talked to anybody, and they came up and said, Pastor, <clears throat> they've been our church for four or five years. Uh, the lady got saved on door-to-door -door visitation. I went back into the home and uh, led her husband of the Lord. He was um, <clears throat> an FBI agent. He had been in Chicago, and then uh, he, had, he had worked on In fact, he got uh, his Ph.D. in, in uh, George Washington University, uh, into science. He's a scientist <clears throat> after being on the streets. Then he did some science stuff in the lab. But anyhow, he's an FBI agent. But <clears throat> So he came to me and, he's, and uh, they said, Pastor, we just want you to know our son now, we prayed for years to have a, have a child. He had a baby boy. He was about five years old, school age. And they said, we just wanted you to know we're not going to be sending <clears throat> uh, our son to the Fairfax Baptist Temple Academy. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I'll never forget, the woman said, well, don't you want to know why? I said, no. I said, that's really your business. Now, I lied, but as a, as a priest of the gospel, you can lie every now and then, you know. I knew I could get it forgiven sooner or later. <clears throat> uh, but I, oh, I was dying to know. I wanted to 
anyhow, I thought, uh, no, well, well, well we, we'd just like to share with you anyhow. I said, we actually visited the classroom and, and went into the chapel program one time and said, we feel like there's, there's too much pressure there in that school to go into the ministry. And I said, well, well then you've made a good decision because we really would like to see all of our kids go into ministry or at least come to the place in their life where they contemplate it whether they are called or not. We, I mean, if you're not called, it's the worst place in the world to be. So we're not saying we push them all, but that's the purpose of our school. We have a Christian school for the purpose of training men, boys, and girls to be servants of Jesus Christ, to do whatever God wants for their lives. And some of them, it's being in the military. We have a lot of military people in our church. In fact, when I, when I resigned from our church... <clears throat> Uh, 12 years ago, I had three major generals who were mem active members in our church. So we had a lot of military people, a whole bunch of colonels and others. But, <clears throat> but I'm just simply saying, the opportunity. I mean, it's got to be on our mind, our heart, where we, we need to be thinking about all the time, what else can I do? I mean, because after all, God has been gracious to us. And we have enough. And so I'm going to take what I have and be able to give it for others that others may know as well. Is God calling you? I mean, say, no, I'm not overseas. I, I'm not going. But do you think there's maybe something for you to do here in Sarasota, in the outlying areas, at Liberty Baptist Church? Maybe there's just something you need to be praying about before Jesus comes back. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together tonight. And thank you, Lord, for caring about each one of us. It is wonderful Wonderful to know Jesus as our own personal Savior. It is such a blessing. And I thank you, Lord, for the privilege and joy that is ours to be able to serve you. Some of us have been able to serve you in a full-time capacity. Others, Lord, serving in Sunday school or nursery or however. But, Lord, help all of us to be faithful witnesses and all of us to be servants and exercising our gifts for thee through our local church. Lord, I pray your blessings to be on us tonight and speak to our hearts, for ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? <clears throat> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the instrumentalist to be able to play the invitation hymn right now. And maybe there's just something in your mind, or maybe God's calling you in the ministry. Maybe you just say, hey, preacher, I really believe this may be something, I've just, at least God's been speaking my heart about, it, and I'm concerned about it, and I just... Once you know, pray with me. Maybe it's one, a teenage boy. Maybe it's a career man, woman. Uh, but say, uh, maybe. And, and if not, perhaps there's something I need to be doing here at the church. Let God speak to your heart. You may want to come and pray while they play an instrument. with the Lord. seated if you would take those cards out if you have those cards everyone should have received a card we're going to give those out every single service you should have that and uh, I hope that you've prayed about giving and uh, one of the things that happens during the missions conference is God may have maybe you've written something down there and God speaks to your heart you can write it and you can add uh, something to that and of course our goal is to be able to reach our reach all the way up to the top there ninety seven thousand dollars and we're uh, halfway through just uh, yesterday and uh, and so we're praying that we'll be able to reach that if we reach that goal then of course uh, we'll be able to take the new missionaries on 
but it's uh, imperative that we'll be able to continue to support all the missionaries that we have. And uh, sometimes folks forget about that, but uh, we want to continue to support the missionaries that we have, missionary projects that we have, and then continue to add missionaries to that. And so I hope that you're praying about that every single day. You don't just pray about it and stop, and you say, well, I've, had a, uh, I, I've made a commitment, and that's it. But you know, we, we need to continue to pray about it, amen? Continue to pray, and uh, uh, we've got a couple more days here, and pray and ask God to help us. I hope that you're praying, asking God to help us to reach the goal and, and, and to use us. I mean, what he was saying here tonight, we need to ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want to use me? You know, God has something for every one of us, amen? Every one of us need to be used by God, every single one of us. What do you want me to do? And uh, God has something for everyone here at this church, every single person. And, and, and if you're not doing something, you know what? You need to find out what it is, and you need to start doing that because God has something. I'm, I'm local church. I'm local church. From the crown of my head to the sole of my foot, I am local church. I was brought up local church. I, was, I sat, my parents were local church. They taught us everything is through the local church. I went and I sat under Dr. Cedarholm there at Maranatha Baptist Bible College, and he would say that all the time about being local church. I, I believe that uh, we work through the local church, and, and God has something for you in this local church. Everyone should be doing something, and uh, there's something for everyone to do, but uh, we all come together for this uh, faith promise, not what can I do, but what is God going to do through me, amen? What could God do through me? What kind of faith do I have to trust in the Lord? I hope that you'll pray about that, and we're going to bow our heads, we're going to have a word of prayer, and then I want everyone to put that card in that plate. Every single person put that card in that plate tonight. Let's bow our heads, ask God to bless. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to serve here at this local church. We, we know that you've raised this church up. Forty years ago, you raised this church up. Thousands of people have been saved as a result of this church. Every year, hundreds are being saved at Liberty Baptist Church. You're using this church. We're reaching the world with the gospel. We're sending it out. And dear Lord, help us to continue to send it out. Use us. Help us to know what you would have us to do. Help us to have faith to trust you, to know that, uh, Father, uh, you want us, you want to use us to give to missions. And, Father, I pray that we'd be open to that. And, Father, we, we would commit ourselves to that. And we pray uh, for this uh, commitment time tonight that you would use it for your glory. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. you of several things here. First of all, remind you tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we'll have a question and answer time right here in the auditorium with our missionaries, and that'll be followed by a potluck luncheon out in the gym, and everyone is welcome to come. I hope that you'll come. We have the school children here, but I hope that you'll come. I hope that you'll come and, and bring some questions for the missionaries, and, uh, and we, we always have a wonderful time with that. And then uh, tomorrow evening, our service starts right at 7 o'clock. And uh, at 7.30, I was looking out in the parking lot, and it was empty tonight. And uh, everyone came between 7.30 and uh, uh, between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you coming. That, that, you know, by you coming, that assures me that you care about missions. Amen? You care about it. You care about it. I look to see who comes. I know who didn't come. 
I, I, but I look, and I'm glad that you came tonight. Some of you came, uh, you came right from work. I appreciate that so very much. We have families. We have uh, families that work all the way up in Tampa. They drove all the way back down here to come to this meeting tonight. They got here for the meeting. That, isn't that great? Amen. They work, all, they work up in Tampa, but they came tonight to be here in the meeting. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord for that. Some of you, you came, but you, and you, came, you might have been here a little bit late, but thank you for coming. That means a, whole, that means a lot. Thank you for coming. And, uh, and I appreciate that so very much. It means that you have a heart for missions. People come and visit our church, and I visit them every week. My wife and I are visiting people, and people say to me all the time, Boy, you people believe in missions there, don't you? <laughs> yep, that's what the church is all about, amen? The church is about missions. What is missions? Evangelism, amen? And so that's what we're all about here. Then Wednesday night uh, will be our last service. We have a candlelight prayer service in that. Uh, and if you've never been to that, then you need to come because it'll put a burden on your heart. We show you how we're supposed to send the light into all the world, and we demonstrate to you how we send the light into all the world. And, uh, and so I hope that you'll come and be part of that on Wednesday night. Then don't forget, on Saturday, the hams and the turkeys for Hope Children's Home will be taking those up there uh, to Tampa. And uh, if you would like to go, you need to talk with Pastor Dan. And if you'd like to go to make sure there's going to be room, because you can go up there, you can take a guided tour of Hope Children's Home and see that. See it for yourself. They've been here. They come here every year for the last 40 years. They come here every year on our anniversary Sunday. And uh, you need to see that place yourself and see what's being done. They'll put prayer requests on the blackboard in the, in the kitchen. And uh, the, the kids and everyone's praying for God to meet their needs. You need to see that place. But we'll be uh, loading those turkeys and hams up on Saturday Morning last year it was 120, wasn't it? Around. around 120 hams and turkeys, and so if you can help us with that, or if you know where we can get some uh, get some discounts on those, and let's do that because you know they count on us. He he stood right in this pulpit and told us they count on us. That you heard him say it, brother Mike. He said it himself, and so here's the figure for the night. Do I have the drum roll? Seventy-three thousand four hundred and sixty-five. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Climbing right up there. Climbing right up there. Well, we need to pray again tomorrow, don't we? We're going to do that. Thanks for coming tonight. I just uh, I enjoyed hearing all the testimonies. The, the missionaries they went way over time, you know. I told them what they're supposed to do. They went way over time. I just let them, let them go. And Brother Calvert, I didn't even stop. He just went, go, went on and went on. And you know, I could have heard, listened to him all night, couldn't you? He just, it was just, it was just flying off. You know, I just love that brother. Just, just coming and coming. I was laughing my head off back there. Somebody punched me in the shoulder and said, "You're laughing too much." You know. If I can't have fun in God's house, I can't have fun. Amen? I just enjoy it. I enjoyed it. Thank you for coming tonight. Let's all stand. We're going to sing. We'll be dismissed. Make sure to thank the missionaries for being here tonight. God bless you.
Bev Watson. Can I see you, Bev and Hannah? Brother Phil, who, Phil, who's going out Wednesday night with them? You and Judy or what? Okay. Okay, you got to...